new webinar this afternoon, The Interplay of Higher Education and Humanitarianism in 20th Century Ireland. And it's a especially a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellen Regan, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in the UCD School of Education, who will be presenting on this topic. And Ellen has been a primary school teacher with over 18 years experience, and she has participated in education focused volunteer projects in Malawi in India and Haiti. And her interests, her research interests are the history of education, international development, volunteerism and teacher identity. And we're very appreciate very much, Ellen, you taking the time to uh, present uh, your, your work to us today. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Marie. I just checked that it can hear me okay and everything is is good. Okay, I'll get started. Um, thanks everybody for giving up your time to come to attend today. As Marie said, the title is The Interplay of Higher Education and Humanitarianism in 20th Century Ireland. So the aim of the webinar is to highlight the potential of humanitarianism and higher education to intersect and impact on each other. So I will look at the capacity within higher education to educate and empower students to engage in humanitarianism. The webinar is focused on three main areas, that is higher education, access to higher education, engagement in humanitarianism, and active participation in humanitarianism while attending third level. Welcome everybody who just joined. Um, I'm going to keep going. So my background, as Marie said, is I'm a primary school teacher. I spent time overseas in Malawi, Haiti and India. Um, I'll be quoting some of the interviews that I did for my own PhD thesis here in UCD, which was a look at Irish women who worked as missionaries and volunteers in education and health settings from 1950 to 2015. And they fulfilled the roles of uh, teachers, doctors, nurses, midwives, lab technicians, and so on. And that was more a look at their motivations and if the structure and ethos of the Irish education system impacted on their decision to volunteer and sustain their voluntary efforts. It was a qualitative uh, study using face-to-face -face oral history interviews. Um, okay. So for today, the layout of the webinar is this. I'll start with a definition of volunteering, and then we'll go on to one of the first theme, which is access to higher education from 1950s to 1980s. There is a, a history of education focus webinar today. That is because my background is history of education. And in this first section, access, that's when I use some of the data from my own thesis. Then we'll look at free second level and then access to higher education, the 1980s on. And the second theme, engagement, we'll look at motivations to volunteer overseas and outcomes of volunteering for university students particularly. And then for the third team, for participation, we look at development education, sustainable development goals, and then take two models from UCD, which is UCD Volunteer Overseas, a volunteer sending organization, and Pinnacle, which is a teaching and research project that I work on here myself in UCD. So the word humanitarianism can be an all-encompassing term and mean different things to different people. And some words that might come to mind would be not-for-profit, international development, overseas aid, non-government organization, charity, volunteer. You might include um, disaster relief or missionary in that section also. But for today, my focus is going to be on international volunteering as an expression of humanitarianism. So the kind of international volunteering I'm talking about would be short-term, usually summer projects, and short-term is defined as less than six months. These projects would really be about one month in the summer where university students travel overseas to work in um, maybe summer camps or to do a type of unskilled volunteering with local communities, it almost always involves some kind of fundraising. And there is, there, there should always be a development education element to this kind of international volunteering too. My attention is also on the higher education sector. 
Um, and in Ireland, that sector consists of seven universities, the Royal College of Surgeons, five technological universities, two institutes of technology and numerous colleges of further education. So although I might um, slip into using the term university, I'm not limiting higher education to universities only, and I'm not ignoring the fact that the same potential and capacity exists within all other sections of higher education. When I say student, I'm generally referring to the phase of emerging adulthood, that is young adults aged 18 to 20. I'm not saying that students can't be older than 25, but the, the majority of the cohort would be 18 to 25 undergraduates generally. And Arnett explains that this phase has arisen due to wider access to university experience among young people. Attending university can offer these students an extended period of personal freedom and self-discovery. And some students you choose to use that personal freedom and self-discovery to become involved in volunteering. So now we we'll move on to what is volunteering. It can be defined as a form of sustained helping in which people actively seek out opportunities to assist others in need and sustain these commitments without any bonds of prior obligation. Another definition is that volunteering is a particular form of civic engagement that entails sustained goal-directed effort with the intention of benefiting others and which is conducted in a structured role without obligation. So really volunteering is a sustained or a continuous effort. It's not a one-off experience and a one-off experience might be like helping somebody fix their tire. That's just being a nice person, but volunteering is a continuous or a sustained behavior and effort. You're helping other people and without any obligation, meaning you do it out of your own free will. Uh, research from New Zealand on volunteer personality reports that volunteers display significantly higher levels of openness and agreeableness than a norm normative sample. They may also have more differentiated emotional states, more willingness to try different activities or go to new places, be more open-minded and willing to consider new and perhaps unconventional ideas. The decision to volunteer is described as a relatively discreet experience underpinned by life history, motives and opportunities. These factors combine in a unique manner, giving rise to an individual path to volunteering. So I'll now speak on the first factor, life history, as we look at the first theme, which was access to higher education. So in this section, I will explore the history of education and use some material from my own PhD thesis to show that university education was not an option for the majority of the mid 20th century Irish population, particularly women. And to anyone who's just joined, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm speaking about humanitarianism and international volunteering as an expression of humanitarianism. And I just said there's going to be a reference to the history of education in the first section of the seminar. So there was in Ireland a long-standing concern that people from the lower socioeconomic backgrounds were heavily underrepresented in higher education in general and universities in particular. This was because there were fees for tuition as well as accommodation and transport costs. These costs made university education impossible for many, while others were deterred by the loss of income to their families if they postponed entering the workforce. So rather, rather than attend university directly after secondary school, many of the women I interviewed entered the civil service or completed a commercial or secretarial course and later worked in an office as a typist, receptionist or clerk. And that would have been very common in Ireland at the time. So in their book, Irish Women at Work, Kylie and Dean explained that young women coveted posts in the civil service and a clerical or secretarial job was perceived to be a highly respectable position. Women undertook other gendered roles, often as a shop assistant or waitress, as well as occupations associated with agriculture. In schools, girls were directed towards the female dominated spheres of employment associated with care and nurturing. Teaching and nursing in particular were regarded as highly suitable careers for young women. Gender-specific legislation, like the marriage bar, curtailed 
female employment and confined married women to the home. Women's work was seen as a temporary precursor to their primary vocation as mothers. The testimonies from the women I interviewed highlight a shared recognition of the gendered, stereotypical and limited employment opportunities available to women at the time. Some describe the options available to girls after secondary school, but they're referring to the 1950s, 60s, 70s and the early 80s. So one of the women said, when I was in secondary school, the options for women were terribly limited. Like nobody ever mentioned any job other than nursing, teaching, go to the bank, civil service. Air hostess was kind of glamorous if you were that kind of way. I don't remember anybody talking about any other particular careers. Another woman said, when we were going to school, there was nursing, teaching, secretarial work in the county council for that kind of thing or join the nuns. Those were the four options and you didn't hear much about anything else really. There was no career guidance, forget about that. So another woman I interviewed who was a medical missionary, and she was also a nun, she became an obstetrician gynecologist, did a lot of surgery um, when she worked overseas in Africa. And it was the convent who decided she would become a doctor. And it wasn't anything she had thought she could possibly do herself because it seemed so impossible at that time that a woman would become a doctor. And she explained, never in my wildest dreams did I have ever thought of doing medicine. Women didn't do medicine in those days, or very few did. It wasn't the done thing. I had friends who had finished school and gone on to be teachers, but medicine, that was completely out of the way. She's referring to about the 1960s in Ireland. So what was more common in this time was to do a commercial course. This included the study of typing, bookkeeping, and shorthand. So one of the women, many of the women I interviewed spoke about it. Almost all of them actually did a commercial course after primary, after secondary school. But one of them spoke about how important it was to her and the value that her mother put on it. And she said, after secondary school, I did a commercial course. Then my mother took a bit of a heart attack. So I stayed in the shop for a year. My mother wisely said to me, if you don't want to stay here doing this, don't go back and do your commercial course because she was stuck like that, forced into doing the farm. We can see from what these women have said that there was no genuine agenda for higher education, particularly for women in the mid 20th century. But something which did have a knock on effect on access to higher education was the removal of secondary school fees. So in 1967, the Minister for Education, Donna O'Malley introduced universal free second level education to Ireland. This meant that fees were abolished in the vocational sector, supplementary grants were offered to secondary schools that chose to waive charges, a means tested allowance for free books and a nationwide transport scheme were introduced. The transport scheme described as a simple but socially innovative service provided free bus transport to students living more than three miles from a secondary school. These initiatives resulted in a dramatic increase in school attendance, which increased by more than 15,000 pupils in the first year of the scheme. The pupil population rose from 103,588 in 1966 to 239,000 in 1974. That's an increase of over 135,000 students in eight years. And all of this meant that more Irish people finished secondary school, which meant they were in a better position to access higher level. In the interviews I did, one woman explained how free secondary education impacted on her life. The removal of fees and the inclusion of the school bus scheme meant she could complete secondary school and go on to study nursing in college. She later volunteered in hospital clinics and refugee camps all around the global south. She expressed her gratitude for the entire scheme when she said the free education enabled me to travel to the community school for five years to do my inter and leaving cert only for Donna O'Malley that's the minister for education at the time only for Donna O'Malley I might never have done the leaving cert it was too expensive my parents would have been able to pay for the first two years but they wouldn't have been able to pay for five and paying the bus fare was too much the free education changed my life it did I don't talk about it a lot, but I know in my head it was a turning point. 
I think actually that lady did the interview because she wanted to put it on record about how free second level education had impacted on her life and changed her life. And it was the main point she wanted to make in spite of all the fantastic things she'd achieved overseas. This was really, really important to her. Many more families, particularly those in rural Ireland, I think could say the same thing about the impact free second level education had on their lives, my own family included. But because the cost of attending university was excessive for most families in Ireland at that time, the government made, government made efforts to address the inherent disadvantage. Fees were waived and maintenance grants were provided to third level students from 1968 on. So we've now moved on to higher education. Later on, the European Social Fund meant that tuition fees were waived and maintenance grants were provided in certain circumstances. But in 1995, the Minister for Education, Niamh Brannock, made history by abolishing university tuition fees for Irish and EU undergraduates. Undergraduate fees were cut by 50% in 1995 and eliminated thereafter. The university re received a block grant in lieu of the fee income. But students who were studying part-time or doing postgraduate post -graduate degrees were still liable for tuition fees, so they weren't included in the free fees system. But that said, Ireland moved quickly from a situation where one in 10 advanced to higher education prior to 1968 to something approaching mass participation in the 1990s. Full-time enrolments rose from 16,007 for the 65-66 academic year to 52,300 in the 1993-94 academic year. That's an increase of over 36,000 students. In 1980, 20% of those at school leaving age were admitted to higher education. So 20% of those who left secondary school went on to higher education. In 1992, that number rose to 36% leaving secondary school, going on to higher education. And by 2003, that had risen to 54%. The growth has tapered off now considerably. A participant I interviewed explained how free undergraduate education impacted on her life choices. She got a fee waiver and a maintenance allowance to attend university in the 1990s. She actually came to UCD. She explained that she volunteered with the homeless in Dublin for a year after university because she felt she should pay something back for her subsidized university education. And she said, for me doing the year in the homeless shelter was important to give a year back to Ireland because I had four years free university. So I thought I should pay back something to the country who has done that. I don't believe there's anything free in life in terms of things like that. Today, attending university is much more commonplace than it was when the women like Grace were young. By 2008, more than 40% of 25 to 34 year olds had a degree awarded from a third level institution. That would be 40% of those under the age of 35 have a third, had a third level degree. And the census figures from 2016 tell us that 42% of the total population had a third level degree, which was up from 13.6% in 1991. In total, 56.2% of people aged 15 to 39 had a third level qualification in comparison to 18.9% of those aged 65 and over. So in other words, more than half of those under 40 have a third level qualification. And that's compared to only 20% of those over 65. And it tells us that a greater proportion of young people have a third level degree. It's worth mentioning at this stage that the university is not entirely free for undergraduates who qualify for free fees. Today, undergraduates pay an annual student contribution, which ranges from about 2,000 to 3,000 euro, depending on the university. And students usually pay some kind of a student levy also, and that would be about 250 euro. And also when considering the effects of any reforms to higher education in Ireland, we must remember that the system has expanded considerably in recent decades, 
as the number of places and selection of courses has increased. But universities do offer those who have a helping disposition many outlets for engagement and volunteer work. Charities involved in areas like mental health, homelessness and healthcare find willing volunteers in uni university campuses around the country. I'll now look at the second theme, which is engagement and what motivates people to choose international volunteering as an outlet for this engagement. So individuals are attracted to volunteering for various reasons, and these reasons usually fall into two categories. That would be altruistic or self-oriented, as in I do it for myself or I do it for other people. And by definition, we would assume that these categories would fall at opposite ends of a spectrum, but in reality, they coexist and people decide to volunteer for a combination of motives. And an, ind an individual may benefit from altruistic deeds through praise, honor, and pride, and just a kind of an internal feel-good factor. And research also shows that parental values are an important indicator of future volunteering, that children reared in charitable families are often more likely to develop the habit of volunteering themselves. And Wilson explains that charitable parents often nurture a charitable spirit in their children and young people are more likely to volunteer if their parents have volunteered and if their parents have presented volunteering in a positive and balanced way, neither too trivial nor too taxing. So the most commonly reported motivation for international volunteering identified across much of the research was the altruistic desire to help others. Altruism covers the broad range of actions intended to benefit one or more people other than oneself. Behaviour such as helping, comforting, sharing, and cooperation. Examples of altruistic motives um, across the research would be to be the best I could be in the world, to be part of everybody who is trying to help others, to do things right and contribute or to give back. A sense of solidarity for the poor, compassion for those in need, giving hope and dignity to the, to the disadvantaged, also to improve things and help people to do something useful or to help that I believe in. So while altruism was the most frequently mentioned impulse, participants also report self-oriented or self-centered, though self-centered sounds quite harsh, but it's more a self-oriented motive to go over to volunteer. And an element of a self-centered or self-oriented motivation is important to sustain um, engagement. as the research will tell us that the opportunity to have personal or self-oriented and perhaps even selfish functions served by volunteering was what kept volunteers actively involved. So ironically, these self-oriented volunteers may provide greater benefits to the organization because through, they may stay involved for longer because they're getting something out of the activity and the experience themselves. And it should really be more of a balanced approach to volunteering. Uh, some of the self-oriented motives cited in the research were an opportunity to challenge themselves, test their limits, push their boundaries, to travel or experience a new, another culture or a search for challenge and adventure. Or there could be finding a social niche or to gain a state of agency with the goal of achieving structure and meaning. Or to gain a broader worldview for adventure take a break from school or work, meet people, have fun or enhance a resume. We're now going to move on and look at the benefits of volunteering, particularly for university students. So the benefits can be categorized according to three values, commitment, competence and connection. Commitment would be finding purpose, expressing values and learning the hard way. Competence, finding oneself able to manage demands, acting in a responsible, organized and knowledgeable manner, and then also professional and personal development, and then connection to a social network and enhanced social confidence. And additionally, the research shows that volunteering may help students achieve greater independence and autonomy and help them make sense of their place in the world. Research from the United States reports that 
Other outcomes were personal development and risk avoidance. And in terms of risk avoidance, university students who engaged in volunteering reported less involvement in behaviours such as binge drinking. I just want to say this is based in the States. I don't know if this is true about Ireland. There are also associations between volunteering and academic attainment and self-confidence also in US college students. And in term, terms of academ academic attainment, Wilson states that undergraduates who volunteer are more likely to pursue postgraduate degrees. But there is a need for more research in this area. And it's crucial also to acknowledge the value of the education offered by the host community as a major benefit and a major outcome um, for international volunteering and the host community that is when I say host community I mean the community that the volunteer goes to work with overseas the host community exposes the student to social realities as well as developmental and organizational experiences that are often invisible in their daily life there are also costs associated with volunteering that is cost to the volunteer, the organization, and the wider community. Volunteer roles may be too demanding for an inexperienced young person. There may be a mismatch between the priorities of the volunteer, of the volunteer and the organization. It's also state, important to state that while the benefits and outcomes for the volunteer is a well-researched area, there is a lack of research on the impacts and benefits for the host community particularly the long-term benefits and impacts. But in order to have some awareness of the context, the needs the rea and the realities of the local community, most volunteer programs include a pre-departure training program. This is to ensure sort of responsible volunteering and ethical volunteering. An essential element of this pre-departure training is participation in development education. And participation is the final theme we'll look at today. So development education has been referred to by many names, like global learning, global education, or global citizenship education. But no matter what name you choose to use, if you are educating for a just and sustainable world, you are delivering development education. It is an important tool for making sense of the complex issues in our ever-changing world. It is an active and creative educational process to increase awareness and understanding of the world in which we live. It should challenge perceptions and stereotypes by encouraging empathy, optimism, participation and action for a just world. Development education can be used to inform learners about global issues such as poverty, injustice, gender equality, humanitarian crisis and climate change. And all of this is done through a human rights lens. Most universities offer modules or entire undergraduate or master degree programs um, devoted to development education. The foundation of any one of these courses or programs for development education should be the sustainable development goals. All development education is grounded in the sustainable development goals. There are 17 of these SDGs and they were adopted by the UN member states in 2015. They provide a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. They're an urgent call to action by all countries in global partnership. The SDGs recognize that ending poverty and other injustices must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education. They aim to reduce inequality and spur economic growth all while tackling climate change and working to preserve the oceans and forests. The deadline set for the SDGs is 2030. So with all of this in mind, I'm now going to take two examples from UCD to show how universities have the potential to meet these SDG targets. And this is achieved through participation, which I said is the final theme today. The first example is UCD Volunteers Overseas, a volunteer sending organization. And the second example is Pinnacle, which is a teaching and research project that I work on here in UCD. So we'll start with UCD View. Uh, one of the ways that UCD makes the most of the increased number of students on campus and the aforementioned period of student self-discovery is to create a program for development education and short-term international volunteering. So 
UCD Volunteer Overseas, or VO, which is often called by lots of people. It was founded in 2003 by the then chaplain, Father Tony Coote. It was seen as a way for students to contribute and give back to society, but also a way for students to create a sense of belonging or a feeling of identity within a very, very large university. So each summer groups of UCD staff, students or alumni. So if you're here and you're a staff um, or an alumni, you can qualify to go overseas with BO. Uh, work overseas on short-term summer volunteer projects in the areas of public health, education, sustainable livelihoods and community development. It's typically for one month. Although the placement is for one month, it's actually a year long project where the students engage in a pretty intense pre departure training for global, it says global citizenship here on the uh, picture, but development education is another word for global citizenship education. So they have, they do a lot of work on development education, stereotypes, cultural awareness, uh, health and safety to prepare themselves to work as ethical and responsible volunteers in that in the short term capacity. So this year is actually the first year after COVID that groups will go out and they're going to Tanzania, one group to Tanzania, one group to Uganda and three groups to India. It's very much seen as a partnership and a cultural exchange rather than a, a white savior or the West knows best approach. So as I said earlier, the impacts and benefits of volunteering on the host community is under-researched and it's very difficult to claim that any major changes are due to overseas volunteering, particularly short-term volunteering like happens here with VO. But that said, studies show that short-term volunteering is more likely to be effective for everyone involved if it is carried out within the same project each year. That is, if volunteers go back to the same placement, the same project in the same country with the same community and deliver the project repeatedly like that. This is in an effort to create a continuity and sustainability within the program. And one way that I have seen VO, oh, the VO used to also go to Nicaragua and Haiti. They don't anymore, but they were two areas they used to go to in the past. So one way I've seen the organization evolve, because I've been involved in it myself, I went to India in 2011 and I'm going to go overseas with Uganda, to Uganda this year. But a kind of an interesting and unique way I've seen it evolve is to make the volunteer placement part of a university degree assessment. So this happens in the School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Science and Sports Science. So what happens is third year physiotherapy students go overseas as a UCDVO volunteer and while they are overseas they complete their practice placement and they are assessed and graded in the same way that they would be if they were doing their placement here in Ireland and a clinical tutor travels with them to ensure that it's all above board as regards UCD assessment. This year and the project I'm going on, there's going to be 11 physio volunteers and they will work with children who have cerebral palsy. So they get the dual benefit of it in that they get an experience of development education and that experience of international volunteering. They get to complete their, it's actually triple because they get to complete their placement. And they also get to encounter different situations and scenarios and challenges that they wouldn't encounter if they were in Ireland. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting way to include development education, global citizenship within an academic program. So the second example um, is a project that I work on myself called Pinnacle, which is um, a teaching and research project based here in the School of Education. It develops grassroots leadership and mentoring skills with female-led education communities in the Global South. It does this by providing fully funded scholarships to women teachers in India and Pakistan. The program is delivered online and it's part time. So the women are still working in their schools. They are principals and teachers in very large schools in India and Pakistan. They continue to work in the school while they working full time while they do the program part time online. And that way they can put their learning into practice in their own context. So far, 19 Pinnacle students have extended their learning to 41 schools, 
over 1,300 teachers and almost 40,000 pupils. Students are supported to develop inclusive field-based action research appropriate to their individual school setting. And the Pinnacle team monitors and evaluates the use of the inputs and investigates teaching, learning and leadership and mentoring within the Global South. We also publish research with students and international academics on issues related to the Indian and Pakistani educational context. There is an exchange element to the program as well where the students, or sometimes we call them scholars, come to Ireland. They came on a summer program this year um, where they're living here in UCD and um, immersing themselves in Irish culture and getting to know academic practices. And then we also travel over to their schools to meet them and collect data and see what life is like in their context. So Pinnacle, and I'm sure many other projects within UCD, responds to several SDGs, but the main one is goal four, that is uh, quality education to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong lear learning opportunities for all. In, particularly, in particular, it responds to target 4.3, 4.7 and 4.B. 4.3 is just uh, equal access to third level education. 4.7 to ensure all learners have knowledge and skills and 4.B by 2020 to expand the number of scholarships available to the developing country to developing countries. And as I said, the students get fully, fund fully funded scholarships to study here in UCD. So UCD and Pinnacle are just two examples to highlight the interplay of higher education and humanitarianism. There are many other research projects, both in UCD and across the higher education sector, which are working towards achieving the agenda outlined in the SDG targets. The way in which the School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science makes the overseas volunteer project a part of the course assessment is unique to my knowledge. And if anybody today knows of any other place that's happening in the university, I'd be I'd love to know about it. So I think there is definitely scope for other schools within the university to incorporate an overseas incorporate an overseas trip as part of the academic program. And the academic program doesn't have to be devoted to development education or global citizenship or anything like that. So in conclusion, we've seen today how access to higher education has evolved since the mid 20th century. The removal of undergraduate tuition fees has given more people the opportunity to access third level education. The time at university facilitates a period of self-discovery and exploration for some students, with some of them choosing to engage in international volunteering. We've also seen the potential and capacity universities have to respond to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by participating in models such as those used by UCDVO and Pinnacle. Education is the bedrock of the SDGs, and where better than a university to facilitate a responsible and critical expression of humanitarianism. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Ellen. You're welcome, David. I'll stop sharing, maybe. Yes, that'd be wonderful. Um, listen, thank you very much. I think we actually got two presentations on the price of one there. I, my history of education is actually lovely and refreshed, as well as all the volunteerism. So thank you very much indeed. You're um, welcome, David. May I open it to the floor? Does anyone have any particular questions they would like to ask of Ellen? I do have a couple lined up, but I will let anyone ask first, if anyone would like to do so. We're all being shy and retiring or eating our lunch. Let me ask the first question, actually. There's, there's one, I think, kind of elephant in the room, so to speak, um, and it's actually the SDGs by 2030. It's a huge ask to have all of those done, sustainable, integrated. So... How, how are we and how, how does one actually kind of work towards this, knowing that it's an almost impossible task? How can that actually be integrated into our programs and into our education structure and indeed into the, the concept of volunteerism here? Yeah, thanks, David. And that is, it's, it is, like you say, the elephant in the room and a huge question. But I think, and the targets are, they're, you know, very, it's a huge agenda. 
and to be able to achieve it. But I think even be having an awareness of um, international development and what development education is and viewing things with a critical lens and you know understanding things like trade justice and where a lot of the unrest of the world is coming from and the deep rooted causes for certain things that are happening. I think if it's even incorporated into academic programs a little bit more than it just being standalone within particular development education programs or um, uh, degrees and modules. I think if we increase our awareness of it, and that can go back even as far as primary schools, because I know it's, it's come more into the agenda in primary schools, but I think if we start a little bit younger um, and to increase the visibility of even organizations like UCDVO that do great work, but aren't very well known within the university. And also that there's some kind of communication and connection between all the different projects that are working towards achieving the SDGs within not only UCD, but the other um, higher level institutions as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think what you say is absolutely right. I think that holistic approach to try and embed it in everything that we do, but also education. Let's be honest, education mm -hmm. is key here. I mean, I think many of us do parts of this, but probably don't realize and, and make the most of it. So absolutely. And in fact, you actually alluded to one interesting thing there that UCDVO is perhaps not as well known as it ought to be. So in terms of a model, in terms of actually opening up and trying to integrate either UCDVO itself or kind of, as you say, other alternative methodologies, how, how might one go about that? Do you have any suggestions or recommendations? I think that, well, part of the we're in another kind of a struggle at the moment because there has been nobody going overseas for the last two years. So usually what happens with UCDVO is people, students go overseas and then they spread the word themselves. And it kind of used to happen a bit more naturally, but now there has this, been this hiatus in um, volunteering work. So we're really starting on the back foot. But I think what, what I would do is I would get returned volunteers to go into lecture theatres and talk to students and tell them what it was like and um, what they experienced the, and the, the real story, like the challenges, because it is extremely challenging to do it and it's really hard work. But I think if you listen to stories and uh, real life experiences, I think that's one way to raise awareness of the organisation because they used to do a lot of like putting posters all over the place and but then there was there's so much competition in the university yes. for different things that are going on but at the time when people were really really into it they would do these crazy fundraisers around the university and that was great for getting attention as well um, so I think it will um arena where awareness will be raised but it's going to take a little bit of time to take these volunteers who've been overseas this year to come back and try again and you know talk about when they've come back but also like I think there definitely is potential within other schools to do what the physio students do and make it part of their um assessment for their degree which is really Absolutely. interesting it's become so popular now the majority of the students going are actually physio students this year okay fantastic so would anyone else have a question to ask of Ellen 